Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Inside the Boards. I'm Amy Chattel, your host for today. And today we are um, trugging along with our Addiction Medicine for Medical Students series. And today our episode is going to be centered around toxicology and pharmacology. So we're going to have a broad based overview of addiction um, with Dr. Jeannie Allen. So, hello, welcome again. <laughs> I'm happy to be back again. And this topic I like even more than the last topic. So I'm very excited to talk about this today. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. I like them both. This is even more exciting. And even more probably up your alley. So it's right. Like, all right. <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, for our listeners, our questions today come from Amboss, which is really fun. So we'll get another taste of different um, groups, kind of question style. Um, so we're going to get started with that. Uh, so question one, uh, which of the following is the most likely effect of this drug at the synaptic cleft? An investigator is studying a local anesthetic that activates both alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. When given intravenously, it causes euphoria and pupillary dilation. Which of the following is the most likely effect of this drug at the synaptic cleft? So our answer choices are A. Increased release of norepinephrine. B. Decreased breakdown of norepinephrine. C. Decreased reuptake of norepinephrine. D. Increased release of serotonin. Or E. Decreased release of acetylcholine. So what are you thinking? All right. Well, test taking skill 101. You have three with norepinephrine and two with different things. So you can kind of group those together. Mm -hmm. But um, that aside, let's go into the stem. So this has alpha and beta adrener adrenergic receptors. Right away, that should trigger you sympathetic. And then euphoria, that should trigger you to think dopamine release, probably in the nucleus accumbens, and also pupillary dilation. Pupillary dilation goes right with sympathetic. You remember... Sympathetic will give you pupillary di dilation and parasympathetic will give you pupillary constriction. So this is sympathetic and the main neurotransmitter in the sympathetic nervous system is norepinephrine. All right. So we have it narrowed down to either increased release, decreased breakdown or decreased reuptake. So how to figure this out? You have to figure out number one, what's it doing, but also they're using this as a local anesthetic. So actually, when I was going through this at first, I'm like, this is actually really difficult. But then I read the question again, and I saw the clinical use. And that's going to be your key to unlock this in a fairly easy manner. So if you think about this, increase release of norepinephrine. This is something like amphetamine. Um, amphetamine could definitely give you some euphoria. Um, but it's not used as a local anesthetic. This is used for ADHD as one example. Okay, decreased breakdown of norepinephrine. So this would be something like an MAOI inhibitor or a COMT inhibitor, um, somatamine oxidase or catechol O-methyltransferase. These enzymes are involved in breaking down norepinephrine. These don't typically cause the euphoria, and these are used for depression in case of MAOIs or Parkinson's. Use of COMT inhibitor. So not what we're looking for. Decreased reuptake of norepinephrine. This is cocaine. And cocaine can certainly cause that increase in dopamine causing the euphoria. And it's also used as a local anesthetic, particularly for nasal surgeries. So you can still order cocaine and it's still carried at certain hospital pharmacies and other pharmacies. And it's used as a local anesthetic. So your best answer here would be C, decrease reuptake of norepinephrine. This will give you the sympathetic effects and also the euphoria in your agent here is likely cocaine. Excellent. Excellent reasoning. <laughs> Do you care to go through the other two just so we kind of know what, I guess, mechanisms of action and drugs are related to them? Oh, yeah, this would be great. So increased release of serotonin. 
you can get some increased release of serotonin when you have these other drugs that are causing increased release of dopamine and norepinephrine. It's sort of a, a minor contribution. Typically, when we think of serotonin modulation, we think about a decreased reuptake of serotonin. So that's the SSRIs, mm-hmm. for example. And um, think about modulation directly at serotonin receptors. Um, so something like ondansetron working for nausea. Decreased release of acetylcholine. This is actually going to be something like Botox. And so it's going to inhibit those snare proteins. You can see it pathologically, either in the side effects of Botox or someone presenting with botulism toxin and toxicity there. And this is some canned tomatoes or some canned tomatoes (laughs) or honey, things like that. Yeah, so these both would not cause euphoria and they would not produce these sympathetic effects. All right, so there we go. Well, that was a fun breakdown. Oh, and then one other thing, I think the thing that can cause increased release of serotonin, we're thinking like an LSD, so that lysergic acid, diethylamide and MDMA. Um, Yeah, those can definitely be involved in that as well. And, you know, MDMA is really interesting because it can also have some sympathetic effects, right. but it's not used as a local anesthetic. Exactly. Uh, so that was the, that was the linchpin for this question was you mm-hmm. had to have your like mechanism of action kind of in your head, but then you mm-hmm. also had to know like, oh yeah, cocaine can be used as like a numbing agent. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah. So cocaine has that additional sodium channel blockade and again, typically used in nasal surgeries it's nice because it numbs and then it also constricts blood vessels. Um, so you're going to get a lot less bleeding. So it's alpha one mediated effect. The other thing about chronic use of cocaine, you chronically constrict those blood vessels in your nose and then your t- tissue, you get some hypoxia there. And that's why you can get some holes in the septum. If patients are chronically using cocaine, you can actually look in cocaine users noses and you can see some changes Um, in their nasal architecture because of this chronic vasoconstriction and tissue hypoxia. Yes, it's a very interesting finding to find. Although um, I have also been told, don't assume, because um, people can also just get perforations in their nasal septum. So it's a clinical clue, but not necessarily a diagnostic indicator. (laughs) Oh, you're absolutely right. And remember, we have other drugs that do this too. Uh, So there are sprayable... Um, like, uh, what am I trying to think? Afrin and things like that. Yeah. 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 That alpha agonist spray. Yeah, exactly. So you can get this from OTC medications if you misuse them. And typically they aren't misused for recreational purposes, but just because people don't understand when you should and shouldn't use these. Yeah, exactly. And I think ephedrine like feels really nice or like it, it, you know, it helps them and then it can cause that rebound. Oh, yes. And so then you're using it more. (laughs) So you can see why it would happen. Exactly. I think it's really important, too, when we're looking at this question, to think about the acute toxicities of these drugs and and what they look like. And we hit on autonomics today. Autonomics are really key for a lot of these. We talked about MDMA. We talked about cocaine, amphetamine. And it's really going to be important to differentiate these some of these autonomic effects So a sympathomimetic versus an anticholinergic. So either ramping up your sympathetic or ramping down your parasympathetic can give you almost identical effects. You want to look at the sweat glands. The sweat glands are going to give you the key there because the sweat glands are under the regulation of the sympathetic nervous system, but they release the neurons there release acetylcholine at the sweat glands. So if it's a, if it's a sympathomimetic you're going to sweat mm-hmm. because you're causing those neurons to fire. You're going to release acetylcholine at the sweat glands and you're going to sweat. If it's an anticholinergic, you're going to block the acetylcholine receptors at the sweat glands and you're going to be hot and dry. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a big key, especially when thinking about toxicology. Yeah. I was just thinking the mad hatter. The mad hatter. <laughs> in my head. <laughs> that's perfect. I love that. I love that way of thinking. What is it like? Blind as a bat, dry as a bone. Hot as a hair. Hot as a hair. Hot as a hatter. It's red as a beet. Red as a beet. Mm -hmm. Blind as, and I think I said blind as a bat, but. Yes. (laughs) And when you see that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, clinically, you recognize it. You're like, oh, 
Yes, they probably uh, took too much Benadryl. (laughs) (laughs) Which, of course, is an antihistamine, but has those anticholinergic side effects as well. Mm -hmm. And so they're not sweating. Exactly. Yep. Hot as a hair and dry as a bone. All right. That's I love I love uh, clinical crossovers where I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, this like pharmacology kind of knowledge I learned in the preclinical years. And then you see it in real life. Oh, oh OK. This makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> that's what they're doing. That's why I like to watch TV medical dramas, too. Sometimes they're inaccurate, but, you know, it's a fun way to also see it in your spare time. <laughs> Definitely. It's harder now, I think, to watch clinical dramas um, just because I'm like, oh, there's so many inaccuracies. Yes. Um, but I will say that I think I had a couple, you know, I was watching a few things maybe between my preclinical years and clinical years. Mm-hmm. And I remember like, oh, yeah, I remember this from that episode. And I, you know, probably got a step one question right because of it. So um, definitely, like you said, it's good for some memory hooks if you can get past all of the like ethical issues of a TV drama. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. I see on Grey's Anatomy, you know, they're surgeons, but they're in there running a PCR. And yeah, that's never going to happen. But <laughs> But then you can still think about what a PCR is and how to run that and what tests do you use it for? So exactly. Now that I've gotten you off topic. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we love it here. All right. So our second question of the day, which of the following is the most appropriate initial action by the physician? A 20 year old man is brought to the emergency department by a friend one hour after suddenly becoming agitated. He reports that it feels like ants are crawling on my skin. He has no history of serious illness and takes no medications. His father has hyperthyroidism. His temperature is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. His pulse is 112 beats per minute. His respirations are 16 a minute. And his blood pressure is 145 over 94. On physical examination, the skin appears normal and is warm to the touch. He is alert and oriented to person, place, and time. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial action by the physician? And your choices are A. Obtain a urine drug test B. Obtain CT scan of the head C. Obtain electrocardiogram D. Request psychiatric consultation Or E. Obtain serum thyroid function tests I am thinking that I really like this question. Mm Mm-hmm. So this is a management question, and I want to look at the STEM and see what's going on with this patient. So he's 20. That could be relevant because if we're thinking about um, mood disorders, schizophrenia is something that comes on in your 20s. He's becoming agitated. Um, He's saying that it feels like ants are crawling on my skin. He doesn't say he sees ants crawling on his skin. It just feels like ants are crawling on his skin. And then you see his pulse is high, his blood pressure is high. So maybe he's in pain, but also maybe the sympathetic nervous system is kicking in. And like we talked about with the previous question, there are several um, drugs of misuse, cocaine, amphetamine, MDMA, that can up your pulse and up your blood pressure. Um, his, His physical exam, the skin's normal. It's warm to the touch. It doesn't say if it's dry or sweaty or anything like that. So we can't get a ton of information there. Um, but he, he is oriented. And there's no mention of any, any sort of trauma or anything like that. So a CT of the head. Okay, but there's no, there's no trauma. He's alert, oriented to person, time, and place. Maybe that's something you want to get down the line. Probably not first thing. Obtain electrocardiogram. He's not having any syncope. His pulse is 112, blood pressure 145 over 94. You know, not terrible. Um, Request psychiatric consultation. He does say he feels like ants are crawling on his skin. Again, he's not seeing them. This could just be his way of describing what he's feeling. And he's agitated, but obtain serum thyroid function tests. So thyroid can cause the increased pulse and increased blood pressure and things like that. Uh, It can make you feel warm. So, you know, his his dad has hyperthyroidism. Um, But also we have A, obtain the urine drug screen. So probably the easiest, most informative test for you right away is obtaining a urine drug screen. Because if you find out that he is taking cocaine or methamphetamine, then a CT 
you don't need it anymore or a psych consultation, you might not need it anymore. You certainly don't need it urgently. And then you wouldn't even need the thyroid function test. And you probably want to do, you know, a physical exam and check out the thyroid and things like that. So your drug screen is, in my mind, the best answer. And knowing that some things like bath salts, which which won't show up, can also cause some of these symptoms like pulse and feeling like ants are crawling on the skin and, and feeling agitated and things like that. And also knowing that new drugs are coming out every, you know, few days. So there are all these new synthetic drugs as people get better at doing chemistries in their home. So I always oh. like to watch the news to see what's coming out and follow social media and, and TikTok and Facebook or whatever your like is to see what's going on. So the Benadryl challenge just came out uh, oh, not just a couple months ago, right? But you never know what's around the corner. So I think keeping up with that could be really useful because some of these things might not come out on a urine drug screen. But, so uh, there are positives for social media use. Maybe not all the time, but sometimes. Um, there are definitely positives for <laughs> social media use. <laughs> yes, as much hate sometimes as it gets. Well, I mean, it perpetuated that Benadryl challenge, and but then it gave you know medical providers a chance to be like, oh yeah, that could be what this is if it wasn't you know super obvious initially. And that might not be first in, in the front of your mind. Mm -hmm. But now that people are taking Benadryl in large quantities for Benadryl challenge, that pops it further into the front of your mind for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So there are some uses. Yeah, I can agree. Oh, man, I, I, I've seen cases from that, like directly from the Benadryl challenge. And mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, <laughs> it is it's amazing. Honestly, it's amazing what the power of social media can have on people. Or just yeah. the influence, even. Power for good and power for ill. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you said, uh, back to the question, you were right. Um, obtain a urine drug screen is like the first initial action you should have. But it's also a good caveat to know that bath salts do not appear on most standard urine drug screens. And so if maybe you know, the urine drug screen had been run and it came back negative and the question was about, okay, well, like, is there a substance or, you know, there could be a question about if the substance, like a list of substances, bath salts would be a good answer choice. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important too to know that there's a right answer to this on the test, but depending on where you're at, you could get the urine and also hook them up and get an ECG. Okay. And clinically, that's not wrong, right? So I, sometimes, not often... You know, you get the med student who, who's a stickler for details, and I can appreciate that 1,000%. And they'll say, well, we also did an ECG. It's not wrong. Clinically, that's not wrong. But there's a best answer on the test. And so it's just important to kind of keep that in mind and don't get frustrated and don't think that your attending is necessarily wrong. It's definitely not wrong to do that. But according to this question on the test, the urine drug screen is the best right answer. Right. And that's, I mean, that's kind of like, and we, we learned to do that, especially once we get into like our clinical years is, okay, yeah. like I know how to answer a test question. I know what, you know, I know how to think like a, a question writer and kind of go for like our best question answer. And then, you know, you translate that to the clinical aspects where you're like, okay, yeah, I know how this is really going to go in real life. Like, I know we're going to get a urine drug screen, but I know we're also going to hook them up to an EKG. And like, if the urine drug screen is taking a while and we're still worried about their agitation, we might throw a psych consult in because, mm -hmm. you know, this was probably a substance use episode. And then... Heck, you might get a CT if like the friend then comes out later and says like, oh, you know, like we were at a party and like, I don't know if this person like lost consciousness or like, I don't know if this person hit their head mm -hmm. earlier in the day. So there's just there's so many like permutations of what actually happens in real life. So. Oh, sure. Yeah. Especially if you know psych might take an hour to come down because they're so busy. You might just go ahead and say, let's call psych, get him in the queue. And it just depends on where you're at. Exactly. That's point. So. Good, like life learning lesson and also test taking lesson. <laughs> right, right. Because they're different because life doesn't fit into nice little multiple choice questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> Try as we might. It would be easier if it did though. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, okay, so in the theme of our episode, um, we have a little bit of time left to talk 
kind of broadly about the pharmacology of addiction and um, maybe a little bit of the toxicology of addiction. Mm-hmm. So like, what are, what are some of the things that we use to combat addiction in the pharmacology sphere? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So some of the things you're going to be thinking about are, let's just start with opioid misuse, because that's the most treatable pharmacologically. Okay. We have a couple tools in our toolkit. We have the long acting, super long acting full agonist methadone. Mm -hmm. And that's nice because if you're looking at plasma concentrations, you don't get a super high peak. What you get is a blunted, sustained high level. So you're warding off some of those cravings, some of the withdrawal, but you're not eliciting some of the, you're not eliciting the euphoria that the user is really after. And that's really driving some of that addiction potential. So methadone is something in our toolkit and methadone, it's half-life can be really long. It can be kind of unpredictable. And don't forget that methadone can prolong the QT interval. So if you have a patient that is on another QT prolonging drug, like a macrolide, um, or they have some sort of congenital syndrome, you're going to want to tread very lightly and think about something else in your, in your toolbox. Another tool in our toolkit is buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist. Buprenorphine actually binds tighter than morphine and other opioids. So if morphine is there, it can kick morphine off. So you can see the potential if someone is actively using morphine, it's in their system, and you give them some buprenorphine, this can actually kick morphine off. um, But buprenorphine isn't as good at at eliciting a response by the new opioid receptor. So the patient feels withdrawal, and it's kind of acting like an antagonist. It's pharmacologically a partial agonist, but you have an antagonist phenotype because the full agonist is around. When they're not on that full agonist, then you get the partial agonist effect where you have the blunting of the cravings and control of some of the withdrawal sy- syndrome. So that's actually a really important concept that it's a partial agonist, but you can see agonist effects or antagonist effects depending on whether or not the full agonist is around. Mm-hmm. So is that also the one where, so they can be on it and then if they were to use, because it's such a strong um, binder to that receptor, the let's say morphine or fentanyl mm-hmm. is like not going to buy. It can't competitive. It can't competitively compete. And so, even if they were to use and they're on this buprenorphine, then they're not. It's actually not going to be effective, um, which can be good for people who you know have that one you know lapse of judgment or just you know decision making fatigue at the end of a day or at the end of a long week. Mm-hmm. So it can still keep them on track. Exactly, exactly. And our drug that's even better for that mm-hmm. is actually naloxone or naltrexone. Okay. That binds super tight and that has full antagonist effects. And so the difference between naloxone and naltrexone is half-life. Naloxone has a really short half-life. Well, not as short as some drugs, but fairly short. So if you're reversing an opioid overdose and you're in upper the UP, for example, in Michigan, because I'm from Michigan, you might have to travel an hour to the hospital. So EMS there will have to have multiple doses and might have to give multiple doses of naloxone because the half-life is relatively short. Now, Trexone is the long acting opioid antagonist. And so this is available orally. This is also available as an implant. And so this is around a lot longer, and this would be something that a patient might take to, to counteract those the, um, to counteract the effects if they were to take morphine, just like you were talking about. And the caveat is, you want you you can't initiate that therapy while they're actively using. You'll throw them right into withdrawal, so they have to be substance free for a period of time. Usually, four weeks is what the guidelines say right now. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Is uh is there some something similar for buprenorphine as well since it's a partial agonist so it could cause it could send someone into withdrawal as well I imagine yeah you definitely need to be cautious about that it it doesn't have quite the phenotype that naloxone does because right. it's a partial agonist doesn't bind quite as tight but you have to be cognizant of when they last use because you could throw them into a sort of withdrawal 
based on the pharmacology of that drug. Okay. And yeah. then that's like something you don't have to worry about with methadone because mm-hmm. um, it's a full agonist mm-hmm. and it kind of has similar, I guess, pharmacological properties compared to like mm-hmm. morphine and mm-hmm. um, other opiates. Okay. All right. It's all becoming a little bit less murky. (laughs) And I think we should also talk about buprenorphine with naloxone because it comes in combination, right? Mm -hmm. So why in the world? Yeah. Or yeah, it comes with naloxone. So why in the world are you putting a partial agonist with an antagonist? That's crazy. Not so crazy, right? So what happens is you take this orally. Naloxone is hit by first pass metabolism super quick. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, when you give naloxone for reversal of opioid overdose, you have to give it injection or nasally. You don't give it orally. One, because they're probably passed out. But two, first pass metabolism takes out 98% of it. So if you take it orally, the only thing you absorb is the buprenorphine. Why is naloxone there? Well, people get very creative and they crush these pills up. And they will snort it to try to get that high. So if you snort a pill and versus taking a pill orally, the pharmacokinetics are very different. You can bump up that peak level more quickly. And the higher you can push those concentrations, the more likely you are to get a, a high, even with a partial agonist. Hmm. So now when you're crushing up the pill, you're also you're crushing up the partial agonist, but you're also crushing up the full antagonist. And so now you are getting around first pass metabolism because you're snorting, but now you have the partial agonist and the full antagonist. And guess what wins? Hmm. The full antagonist. (laughs) So you get no effect uh, when you snort this combination. It's a diversion mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you just can't get the high off of it that you want to, even if you try to snort it. Wow. What an interesting, like, I mean, that's just like creative pharmacology. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's the reason they also went to little dissolvable, like, have you seen the Listerine strips that you put in your mouth and they dissolve? No, I haven't. Okay. What's this? Okay. So they can have buprenorphine in in this form too, Mm -hmm. where there are these dissolvable strips and you just put them on your tongue. And so you get absorption sublingually, but you can't crush the strip up. Um, So you can't snort the strip. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so you can get the little listerine strips if you want to kind of see how those sublingual strips work how cool okay yeah i'll have to like i don't know snoop around see if anyone's describing describing them so i can see them and then you have minty fresh breath oh how wonderful <laughs> what an added benefit <laughs> <laughs> all right and then so like a uh, alcohol use disorder can we use is that naltrexone Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you off topic again. I do this well. (laughs) Um, So as we were discussing in the last podcast, this opioid system is intimately involved in addiction. And so we're starting to see naltrexone used for other sorts of addiction. Alcohol addiction is, is one of the places that naltrexone is being used. Also, it's being used for weight loss, as we talked about before. This might gain some more traction in some other um, addictions. I don't know, but keep your eye on that. But now Trexone can definitely be used for alcohol use disorder. Um, one of our old, older drugs that's not super useful because of apply, a compliance is Anabuse. And Anabuse is basically the disulfiram drug. So it causes that disulfiram reaction, right? And so... Ethanol is metabolized from ethanol to acid aldehyde to acetic acid. And if you inhibit aldol, aldol dehydrogenase or aldehyde dehydrogenase, then you build up acid aldehyde and you get a hangover, you get incredibly sick. So that's a little bit older tool because people, if they want to drink, they just skip their morning dose of antabuse and then they can drink. But we're seeing now Trexone come online because it can curb some of those cravings, which is really interesting. Okay. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see if, I don't know if there's any studies out there or I just haven't, you know, looked at them or read up on them, but like for like gambling or for video gaming or internet addiction, Mm -hmm. like shopping addiction, that's a thing. Mm -hmm. I think (laughs) I definitely think it's a thing. (laughs) It is absolutely 100%. I mean, I definitely, this was like a routine for me after I finished, um, we, our school was in three block weeks. 
So mm-hmm. at the end of a Friday exam period, I would go to TJ Maxx and I would go buy a bunch of like candles or like whatever I felt like buying that day. Uh-huh. Just, and it made me feel good. So like I could cool. definitely see that. <laughs> You're not, you are not, you are not alone in that. And, and, and actually, so if you're a physician listening to this and you're interested in getting into addiction medicine, um, we have a program called My Cares, mm-hmm. M-I-C-A-R-E-S, and it's a pathway to addiction medicine. And if you're interested in that, go look that up. But we just did it. We just did a module. And by we, I mean the other members of the team, but I just looked through it. And shopping addiction was part of that. Shopping, gambling, internet, gaming, things like that. So the research is being done right now. So stay tuned. There might be pharmacological treatments while you practice. Oh, very cool. (laughs) Yes. Okay, so just briefly touching on our toxicology principle of the episode. Toxicology is kind of like, I think of like, someone has lead poisoning or someone Mm has, you know, like in this... um, Oh my gosh, a Tylenol, acetaminophen, like overdose, mm-hmm. like those things I think of as toxicology. But, you know, use it, misusing um, any kind of drug can really have some kind of toxicology. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we already talked a little bit about the sympathomimetics versus the anticholinergics. But you really want to become familiar with the acute toxicity for each drug. Um, certainly the psychedelics have the hallucination, disorientation, and you can, you can differentiate LSD from something similar like PCP because PCP patients tend to be more aggressive and things like that. And I think that's all very important. Um, but like we were discussing a, a little bit earlier before this podcast, there's some long-term issues associated with being on some of these substances, um, you know, you're in the throes of addiction and you're just trying to get your next fix. And maybe uh, you're buying, this actually just happened in my hometown. Maybe you're buying some fentanyl um, off of, I think they're using Instagram or TikTok or something for this. One of these social media platforms and you buy it. And it's actually one of these, these very potent forms of fentanyl. And these people that got this very quickly died right? So you can get these super potent forms and that can be something really awful. You can end up using a dirty needle because you just want to get your fix. You neglect your hygiene. And we're talking about, you know, not brushing your teeth, having cavities. If you're an IV drug user, you're already at risk for endocarditis. And then you put cavities and not brushing your teeth on top of this. And, and that just, that just makes for a really awful sort of sort of picture. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the long-term effects, you really got to think about that in toxicology. And also like there, like you said, like these things are not benign. Like mm-hmm. they, they are, they can cause reactive oxygen species. You're overloading certain like systems in your body. So over time, chronologically, you are going to develop issues potentially on top of just not mm-hmm. taking care of yourself potentially. Yeah. If you want a good example of this, and he's been fairly open about it, go look at earlier early videos of Ozzy Osbourne and late videos of Ozzy Osbourne. Um, he's admitted to using a lot of different substances. And there are significant brain changes when you look at the MRI of users versus non-users. And so you mentioned ROS and things like that. And I think there's a lot of differences that we have yet to appreciate in patients who are long-term chronic users. Um, versus patients, you know, who, who aren't. And it's, it's really complicated, right? Because, you know, let's take Ozzy. Is there an element of dementia there? I don't know. I'm not trying to diagnose him, but let's just say there is or there isn't. And how do you figure that out? And what's due to the drug use? But let's say he was living in Flint, Michigan. And what's due to the lead he had in the water? So again, I'm not trying to diagnose Ozzy Osbourne, but I'm just trying to say that this is super complicated, right? Yeah, and absolutely. It's hard to point, it's hard to point just at one thing, but I think you can definitely say that there are long-term consequences that we're, we're starting to figure out the mechanisms behind this. Okay. I mean, even if it was just cocaine, I imagine like not getting enough oxygen and like nutrients to the brain can have some, I mean, like just thinking about like what a stroke is Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, how long-term use of cocaine can cause MIs and strokes. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, okay. You could see how over time those short-term effects can be the long-term effects on the brain or other parts of the body. Oh yeah, for sure. 
And you can even see short-term effects with some of these sympathomimetics where they can cause a stroke or they can cause uh, an MI because, you know, we saw in the example of the heart rate go up, the blood pressure go up. And um, it's just sort of individual dependent if and when this is going to happen. Um, but it's, it's a possibility for sure. Okay. Lots to think about and <laughs> learn and process. I've learned a lot this episode. I, I really enjoy this. So thanks again for having me. This has been amazing. Uh, no problem. Honestly, thank you so much for being a part of the series and you know, taking time out of your day to educate me and educate everyone else who's listening. My pleasure. If you can't tell, I get really excited about this and I get you off topic all the time. Oh yeah. It's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs>